Welcome. Thank you for joining us today for this two-part webinar on the challenges and the opportunities of advanced care planning. I'm Peggy McGuire, the president of the Cambia Health Foundation and also co-chair of this roundtable. The purpose of our roundtable is to foster ongoing dialogue about improving care for people with serious illness. We work in five priority areas, the delivery of person-centered and family-oriented care, communication and advanced care planning, professional education and development, policies and payment systems, public education and engagement. Today's program as part of a two-part series on advanced care planning, and we're delighted that you could join us today. For more information about the roundtable, you can follow the um, link on this uh, slide to learn more. It's at the National Academies of Science, Education, and Medicine, the roundtable on quality of care for people with serious illness. I want to thank our sponsors of the roundtable. They're listed here on your screen. Um, we could not do this work without our sponsors. And also um, all of these organizations are committed to engaging in this dialogue with us to foster better care for people with serious illness and their families. So thank you very much to our sponsors. I want to note that this session is being recorded and you will be able to uh, see the materials archived at the National Academies uh, website. So please uh, follow this link for the recorded materials. I also wanna thank our planning committee. This workshop has been um, long underway. It's been postponed um, due to uh, COVID and the planning committee just works so hard and tirelessly to provide relevant information to us. And we so appreciate all of the planning committee members whose names appear on your screen. Now I'd like to turn the time over to my co-chair, Dr. James Tolsky. James. Thank you so much, Peggy. Uh, and as you just mentioned, uh, planning for this conference started, I think it was almost 18 months ago. Um, and the roundtable has a process through which we think about different topics that we want to bring up and, and focus light on. And this topic rose to the very top of the topics that were, that were being proposed by members of the roundtable. But a lot of us were sitting around the room saying, is there anything new to say? I mean, advanced care planning has been around for many, many years, over 30 years. It's been perhaps one of the most well-researched areas in serious illness care. Uh, and a lot of us were wondering whether this had just been sort of beaten down and was there, was there really anything new? And as we were discussing this around the table, what became very clear was that this was in fact an area of intense controversy where there were many different opinions about the value of advanced care planning, what the, uh, in what situations advanced care planning would be most effective, what the definitions should be, and lots of key questions that needed to get answered. So whereas we started by wondering if there was anything really new to say, we all agreed by the end that there was not only a lot new to say, uh, but a lot that really needs to be cleared up um, and shared. So with that, um, we are incredibly excited uh, to be able to to have this conference today and to highlight and explore various perspectives related to advanced care planning. The one last thing I'd like to mention is that in the era of the pandemic and COVID-19, this topic has taken on a new importance. Uh, so many of us have unfortunately seen patients who have had to make decisions about life-sustaining treatments, uh, oftentimes with very little advance notice. And this has heightened the concern about and the need for advanced care planning and how we choose to do that and what decision-making ought to look like in those situations. And so therefore it's very much on top of mind and we hope to use what we learned today to talk more about that. So what I would like to do now is to introduce the co-chair of the planning committee, uh, Dr. Robert Arnold. 
Dr. Arnold is the Distinguished Service Professor of Medicine at the University of Pittsburgh Department of Medicine. He is also the Chief of the Section of Palliative Care and Medical Ethics and the Director of the Institute for Doctor-Patient Communication uh, at the University of Pittsburgh. And all of that means that he basically runs everything related to palliative care and communication studies at the University of Pittsburgh and uh, is really one of the nation's uh, great treasures and resources on this topic. So I'm happy to hand this over to Bob. Thank you. Um, I want to thank James for, uh, well, I'm not sure that I want to thank James for inviting me to be one of the co-chairs. He invited me um, a year to two years ago and we thought, oh, this will be great. We have these fabulous planning committee meetings and then the world changed uh, with COVID and we've put this off a couple of times. And to be honest, we were like, oh, who's going to show up? And you know, we heard that normally 50 to 100 people come when it's in person. And I'm looking that 418 of you uh, are already participating and that over 1,300 people expressed interest. And so we're just thrilled because you all are going to see over two weeks an all-star group of clinicians and experts have, I we hope, a really vigorous debate over what advanced care planning is and how it works. Uh, before we start, though, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to the National Academy staff, who has done a just phenomenal job of hurting um, cats and uh, speakers and getting us to run on time and do the work that we need to do. This, whatever you think of this workshop, it would be nowhere near as good as it's going to be if it wasn't for the incredible Academy uh, staff. Normally this is a one day workshop because we didn't wanna make you spend five hours on Zoom. It's, <clears throat> two and a half hours today. And then next Monday, there'll be a two and a half hour sort of conclusion. We have recordings that will both be available on the web as well as the slides. So you'll be able to look at all the material. I should be clear that there's going to be some vigorous disagreement over these two webinars. While the notion of patient-centered care is something that all the participants care about and spend their time working towards, the question of whether and how advanced care planning helps us or distracts us from achieving those goals is something that on our planning committees and hopefully over these five hours, you will get a sense of where the disagreement lies and be able to come to your own conclusions about what the next steps will be. So we don't view this as here's the consensus. We view this as here's the disagreement, here's the evidence for it, here are the beliefs for it. What are your conclusions and what do you think in your personal lives as well as your public work lives you think the next step should be? I wanna get us started by introducing uh, the uh, planning committee co-chair that I've worked with over the last 18 months. Joanne Reeschneider, who is the Executive Vice President of Clinical Operations, as well as the Chief Nursing Officer for Genesis Healthcare, and is representing the Hospice and Palliative Nurses Association, who is going to get us started. Thank you so much, Joanne. We're really excited about starting the webinar. Great, thank, thank you, Bob. It's really been a pleasure to work with you on this and it certainly has been an adventure. Um, why don't we go ahead and get started? I'm really pleased to welcome our four speakers for session one. First, we'll hear from Maureen or Mo Stewart uh, and Wyvonia Y. Woods Harris, who are both volunteers with the National Patient Advocate Foundation. Welcome to you both. We're so glad that you could be here today. And then next, we'll hear from Dr. Bernard Lowe, 
President Emeritus with the Greenwall Foundation and Dr. Rebecca Sudor, who's a professor at the University of California, San Francisco School of Medicine. So let's get right into our conversation. Um, and we're going to begin with Mo and Y, as I said, and they've uh, very graciously agreed to join us today to anchor our conversation, um, both in today's workshop as well as uh, next Monday's workshop as well, uh, by sharing their lived experience of caring for someone with a serious illness. So they're both going to touch on the role of advanced care planning and the complexity of communication and assuring a loved one's wishes are actually followed at the end of life. Mo and Y, as I said, I'm so grateful. We are so grateful for your generosity. Um, and Mo, I'd like you to start us off, if you would. Do you want to go ahead? There she is. Hi, Joanne. Hi. Thank Mo. you so much. Thank you, so, everybody. It's great to have you here. So could you start by telling us a little bit about your father and your father's illness? Sure, my dad, Bill Clark, was diagnosed with prostate cancer in 2014. Um, he was pretty sick before that for about three years, but because he didn't have private insurance, he was not very compliant with following through with lab tests or uh, scans, things like that. So we were notified of his diagnosis pretty late in the game. Um, he was adamant that he did not want to die in a hospital, but because of the rural location of my family's home in Northern California, we didn't have hospice services available. So it was clear pretty early on that that was going to um, be the job of my sister and I to do any palliative care that he needed, but we really didn't have a roadmap for how that was going to work. So we tried to figure it out as we went along because the one thing my dad never wanted to do was face the reality that he needed to fill out an advanced directive or have this conversation with us. Um, the little clues that he did give to us, and then finally the big event was um, he wanted to participate in the Death with Dignity Act that was available to him because his oncological care was all in Oregon. Um, and so that was the route that we took. Okay. So can you share a little more, if you would, about advanced care planning and, and what that was like for your father and your family? Were there healthcare providers who were formally involved in that with you? And um, what, what was that like? What was your experience of that? I am the oldest of three children and I'm much older than my sister. I'm 10 years older than her. And I was 20 years older than my brother almost. So, and I'm the only one in the family with any healthcare experience. I think my dad was very comfortable coming to me and, and asking me if I would assist him with that once he found out it was an option from his oncologist. And so the family wasn't really involved. It was, it was kind of a, it, it was just my dad and I, this mm -hmm. pact that we had. And he asked me not to mention it to the rest of our family. Our family is very Catholic, very conservative in that regard. And I did not. So it wasn't something that I had the support or, or um, none of my family ha had any clue that my dad and I had, had gone to his provider and discussed this option. Um, and yes, his oncologist didn't recommend per se, but let him know that it was an option for him going forward, but that he had to make a choice about whether or not he wanted to start the process while he was not cognitively impaired, while he was still able to make his own decisions. And I think that was when, the day that my dad realized that was going to be the eventuality for him. Okay. Were there other wishes that he expressed that were talked about, documented at the time? Documented, no, not with his healthcare provider. It was a very quick trip to his oncologist who was able to provide medication for him should the need arise. Mm -hmm. And my dad really didn't wanna talk about it 
except to say um, just some palliative measures that he preferred. He wanted to be in his bed if possible at home and have family around and basically not be in a clinical setting. That was his main concern. Okay. And so um, how, how were those wishes honored? Was, um, were his expressed issues then followed uh, at the end of his life? So I, I have become a champion and an advocate for advanced care planning because nothing is ever black and white and my dad's situation wasn't either. We, I knew ultimately what he wanted, but there were so many things that happened between the time that he, he was unresponsive or, or wasn't able to uh, respond to us verbally and the day that we knew it was, he, he, was, he was slipping away. Mm -hmm. things like um, infection control. He never discussed that with me. So ultimately I made those decisions for him. Um, hydration, nothing he ever talked about with me. I, I thought I knew what he probably wanted, but the gap that we left because he wasn't able to address those issues or he wasn't ready to face that reality, it leaves families or decision makers second guessing the choices they made years after. Mm -hmm. Yesterday was the four year anniversary of my, of my father's death. And I still wonder if I did everything the way he would want. Oh my, you know, I'm wondering Mo, as you're relating your story and you, you're thinking back on that time, is there additional or different communication um, that could have helped, would have helped? I think that my dad really had wonderful care from his oncology team. Every provider he saw, every clinician, every nurse, every lab assistant, everybody was fantastic. The thing that I thought was lacking was with his oncology team, when they let him know that there was probably nothing else they could do for him and that it would be palliative from here on out, there was no follow-up with a case manager or even clergy or, or anybody like that. I think that was the missing key for my family. Um, my dad did not want to talk about it. His oncologist tr tried to initiate the conversation. I, I will say that, but, but my dad was not ready in that moment, in that setting, in that office, having just heard his, his final or his prognosis, he just wasn't ready. And because we didn't have those hospice services, we didn't have a case manager to follow up with. We just kind of were left to our own devices and did the best we could, but it's difficult to plan for something for somebody else without their participation. Mm -hmm. So I think mm -hmm. probably if we had been bolstered or, or if we'd had access to some mental health uh, providers or even a case manager, that probably would have helped tremendously. Yeah, some, some sort of continuity, it sounds like would have been helpful. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for, for sharing your story. We're going to turn to Y now, and I'll, I'll ask Y to turn on her camera and join us. Hi, Y. Hi. <laughs> Good to see you. Thank and you. Thank my thanks to you as well for joining us. So I'm, I'm going to start sort of in the same place where we did with Mo and ask if you would tell us a little bit about your husband and, and his illness. I will be happy to. My husband's journey began, uh, his chronic Ill, illness began when he was 34 years old and he was diagnosed with hypertension. And um, we married at, 30, at 34. And that was one of the things that criteria that I asked him to make sure we could get the hypertension in, under control before getting married. So. Uh, he started that at 34 years, and then he developed Crohn's disease and around 40, and he had to have several surgeries for that. He started uh, having kidney problems, and also we found out that he had a diagnosis of uh, polymyositis, um, and we treated that uh, at the same time that he had his uh, gallbladder done. 
And then he had, uh, on 2017, he had uh, an appointment to go and have blood uh, drawn from his uh, kidney doctor. And we ended up in the emergency room because that's what they, where they told us to go on a Saturday evening. And this started uh, probably around two o'clock and they got his uh, IVs and blood started. And we felt like it, what may have happened is that it, they, the blood went too quickly. So they took him to the, a room to complete his blood and he developed a pulmonary overload and also a heart attack. And we went to ICU where they were able to bring him back. Uh, after that, the problems that came after that with all, all of the things that went on with him, uh, he ended up having end-stage kidney problems and having to start on dialysis. In the process of two years, uh, he lost both legs, and so he was a bilateral amputee. And so one of the things that I think, uh, I, when, when I read some of the forms that we, many of the forms we filled out, we started talking about uh, what we wanted to happen at the time of end of life, or if we were, there was things that were happening that we needed to correct. Um, being a healthcare professional and as surely as a case manager, it was something that I talked about and I actually pushed it on so that I could become a trainer for uh, advanced care planning. So I had care plans on my, table on my dining room table actually trying to get my family just to go over and look at it and see ask me what it's about so that I could share that with them but in 2005 um, I, I started my advanced care planning because I was at that time I was an oncology research uh, coordinator and we were in the office and we were talking about all of the people that came in that didn't know what they wanted to do or would not talk about it. And so we made a pact in this office, in this clinical research office that we would all complete our advanced care plan and our living will, which we did. So that was my first one in 2005. But as I said, with all of the things that kept happening, kept happening to my husband, we decided in 2015 that we would go along with uh, looking at our legal will. We would have our durable power of attorney and also our health care uh, attorney, and with me being the attorney, in fact. So we did those uh, just, I mean, I talk about it all the time. My family, even as, as they walk in, they go, what is she going to say to us today about making sure we have things in order? So with his 11 diagnosis, he had an emergency. And in October, he had that emergency. And when the doctor came in and said, you have three areas in your uh, intestines that need to be repaired. Do you want to have the surgery? And my husband said, I want to live. And so it actually put a block to all of the things, the preparation that we had made and all of the forms that we had done. So that was one of the things that I think about as I talk to people and as I talk even today is having to get across that disconnect that you prepare and then there's this emergency and it seems to be that it gets waylaid. Right. Right. So, so why I know that you're a nurse and you, and you mentioned some of the roles that you've had, it sounds like you really were the manager of the advanced care planning process um, for your husband and with your husband over the years. Were there uh, other healthcare professionals um, in your circle, in his circle, who were involved in advanced care planning dialogue over time? Oh yes, my my physician, my PCP was uh, he was aware we had. I've been in, uh, a nurse at the same time that he was a doctor, so he knew our desires, he knew our will, uh, and we I had given the form uh, to the office. But in the process, when the physician made the change to not be in, the, in so busy in the hospital and in the office and you actually got your hospitalists to come in in the hospital. So that, that changed the dynamics of him having all of that information at hand. Uh, even though he came to visit us every day, but it was more of a social visit and not 
as not to prepare uh, to get uh, treatment, to do treatment, to prescribe. And can you tell us a, a little bit um, about your husband's end of life then? Um, you said that you, you got to a point where you had laid some plans and then there were some changes in his condition and he sounds like he said he wanted to live and that maybe changed things up a little bit. What happened? What happened next? What happened is that he was he went in the hospital with a small bowel obstruction. They sent us home. And then in the middle, he got no relief. And so we went back to the hospital. At that time, he, uh, we didn't know, we just thought something was going on that why he continued to have pain. But they found out that, it, that it, the uh, obstruction had progressed to the point that they needed to do emergency surgery. And that surgery went, started at 11 o'clock at night they had to call in a doctor from another hospital, as a matter of fact. So that doctor knew nothing about anything except the fact that he needed to get him to surgery. So I think that's what causes uh, some of uh, the situations that go on is because you do get into a place where you, you know, you, all you can think about, I, I say it so often, ER and ICU is not always the, best place to start advanced care planning. You really have to have it. And even in the times, like I said, I was there, but I, I, I was going to be his attorney. In fact, in fact, if he could not make a decision, but his decision was that he wanted to live, did not think about the fact that it would, it would lead to this. I see. And so, uh, and, and let me just quickly say, we, he coded, I was not there. Uh, he coded one day, and then the, the last time he coded, I was there with the papers in hand saying to him, saying to the doctors, do not intubate him, do not let him go. We have, we've, we've been preparing for this for many years, and he has made his decision. He had already made the decision, so that's where we, we came to that. And is, is that what happened then ultimately? And you said, you said, do not let him go. You mean? No, I said, let him aggressive. go. Oh, yeah. do let him go. Yeah, okay. they were, when, by the time I got back, I was out right out in, outside the waiting room. But by the time I got there, they had already started. Um, mm. And so uh, after I noticed that they weren't getting any response, I said to them, let him go. Uh, uh, do not intubate. They were getting ready to intubate him again. Mm -hmm. I see. Oh my, it was a, a long and, and difficult course for him and, and for you as well. I'll, I'll ask you and end with the same question that I asked Mo in terms of communication. Is there communication over that period of time or late in the illness that could have been different or um, you know, had it been different, it might've been more helpful to you? I, I, one of the things that I always say, as I said, I had given my physician those papers, uh, all of the papers that we needed to say that his, to talk about his wishes. I think one of the things I say to people now is that they need to be sure and uh, follow through on it. If there's a way we could scan into their telephone, do a picture into, because even people that go into the hospital emergency, most of the time they have their telephone, you know, telephone. So scanning mm -hmm. in and just working on I apologize. I thought I took the phone off the hook. Um, okay. uh, but just following, following through, following through and saying it over and over and over again. I call it my precepts of purpose. Nah. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story. And thanks again to Mo. I know you're going to stay with us and we'll have a question and answer period um, after we hear from our next two speakers. So um, at this point, then I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Bernard Lowe to join us. Bernie, um, great to see you. And we'll let you go ahead and get started. Okay, uh, thanks very much, Joanne. First, I want to thank Ms. Stewart and Ms. Woods uh, Harris for sharing their experiences. They're very powerful experiences, which I think really grounds the rest of today and, and, and next week. Uh, things don't always work out the way we hope or we would like. 
I am sort of a bridge, a transition. Uh, there can be a lot of speakers uh, over the next uh, two sessions dealing with uh, a lot of questions. I'm just going to raise some questions, uh, sort of gives us some food for thought. So I have no conflicts of interest. On the next slide uh, is a picture of a young woman uh, who on a winter day in Missouri uh, skidded off a highway in uh, 1983, crashed her car, was found unconscious, resuscitated, but never regained consciousness. She was diagnosed, this is Nancy Cruzan. She was diagnosed to be in a persistent vegetative state uh, at the time that had a different meaning than they had today. Three years later, her parents, after realizing and it, being told that there was no likelihood she would regain consciousness, asked to have her feeding tube removed. The case went through a very elaborate set of uh, court decisions, ended up at the US Supreme Court, where on the next slide, uh, the decision there was that her prior statements uh, could be uh, discounted uh, by the state of Missouri. She had said things like, I don't want to live as a vegetable. If I couldn't do things for herself or even halfway, she wouldn't want to live that way. The Supreme Court ruled that states like Missouri could say that life-sustaining treatment, uh, I'm sorry, a feeding tube could be withheld from a, a patient who no longer can make decisions for herself only if she had executed a signed legal document or made a very specific oral statement rejecting the specific intervention in that situation. Well, this federal ruling on the next slide uh, led to a whole lot of uh, activities. Uh, there really started to be a, a na national focus on written advance directives. Many states passed laws to authorize the appointment of a healthcare proxy. And there was a Patient Self-Determination Act, uh, which encouraged people in admission to the hospital to be notified um, of their right to make it, uh, advanced directives. It raised the question at the time, and we'll talk about this a lot throughout the next two days, who should do advanced directives? This case really triggered the idea that everybody, even young, healthy persons, should complete an advanced directive. And I'll have another slide later on about how that thinking may have changed. On the next slide, uh, there, however, are limitations of these written advance directives or very specific oral statements. First, as we've heard already from Ms. Stewart and Ms. Uh, Woods-Harris, we can't always anticipate the actual clinical decision and situation uh, neither the doctor nor the patient or the family may be able to anticipate everything that's going to happen. And secondly, the whole focus on specific directives and written documents really overlooked what may be much more important, deliberation and discussions. And these have to involve, as we've heard from our two previous speakers, a patient, the surrogate, perhaps the rest of the family, and also the physician, and it should be a plural there, uh, as we heard from our, our prior two speakers. On the next slide. Now, what is advanced care planning? You're gonna hear a lot of uh, different definitions of this over the next uh, two sessions, but I'd like to suggest some commonalities. First, it's a process, and it's a process of discussions. It's not a document. It's not one specific directive. Secondly, it starts with the patient's values and goals, not with specific medical interventions. We're trying to sense of the patient's uh, core uh, values. Third, it's not only about withholding interventions. Patients can also talk about their preferences regarding a good death. We heard that dying in uh, a patient, dying in his own bed was important. Uh, to Ms. Stewart's father. Uh, and I think one of the hopes of advanced care planning was that it actually relieves the burdens on surrogates put into the role of making decisions in situations that 
uh, are complicated and may not have been anticipated. And I think it's an open question as we'll hear throughout the next two sessions, whether um, that actually is what, what happens in practice. On the next slide. Uh, question of who should complete uh, advanced, who should start advanced care planning and when? And there's a lot of options. Perhaps everybody in the community, including healthy young people, everyone in the healthcare system, no matter how uh, well or sick they seem to be, perhaps patients with serious chronic illness where things are starting to tip towards becoming more complicated, perhaps going downhill. And finally, perhaps just in time, patients who are going downhill quickly and where it may be more urgent to get a sense of what they would want and not want. Next slide, please. Now, there are lots of limitations of previous patient statements as guides to specific decisions that come up. Uh, patient may not have considered a situation that requires a decision later. And we heard about, uh, Stuart mentioned, well, infections, nutrition, uh, and this Woods Harris talked about the, the emergency uh, bowel obstruction uh, that required a decision about surgery. Second, the values, goals, and preferences of a patient may change. We know that people adapt to disabilities they thought they would find absolutely abhorrent. Uh, many people, for example, say they would never want to go to a nursing home, and yet some of them when they in fact go to a nursing home, find things that they can still enjoy and make life worthwhile. Third, and I'd like to underscore this, what is best for the patient now in his current situation, in the current decision, may be inconsistent with prior discussions they've had and prior preferences that were expressed. Uh, I wrote a paper with colleagues, including uh, Rebecca Sidore, talking about a patient of mine actually, who uh, had said she never wanted to go to the hospital. She didn't want to be admitted uh, and yet broke her hip, was in terrible pain. Uh, and finally, we, and she had not thought of that, about that before. And as we talked, I said, for you, the best way to relieve your pain will be to go to the emergency room. And sometimes surgery is a way of relieving pain. Finally, in making, uh, in doing advanced care planning, a patient who realizes that, that realize the decisions are complicated, you can't think of everything, may want to give the family leeway, not to always try and focus on what the patient would have wanted, but another question instead, what's the best decision to make now in the situation he's in? The next slide, please. I've said that decisions are uncertain and difficult. Uh, uh, Ms. Stewart said, things are never black and white. There's a lot of gray. Well, a question that is always very commonly comes up and it's very hard to articulate in advanced care planning is how much burden is the patient willing to go through for how long and for what benefit and probability of benefit? And that shifts over time as the, the disease evolves. One simple-minded decision is that you can make a transition to palliative care and really almost predominant focus on, on comfort care and withdrawing life-sustaining interventions. You can do that either too soon and subject yourself to recriminations later that what if we had tried this? Or you can make that decision too late and saying, my gosh, we put him through a lot his last few days. Many of the patients I talk to, and I still care for a panel of patients, many of whom I've known for, for decades, up to 30, 35 years. Many people want something like reasonable attempts to treat reversible problems up until a point. And at a certain point, they want to stop. And trying to define that point in advance is just really hard. Third, we already heard glimpses that 
emotions are really important in this. It's hard on the surrogate, it's hard for other people in the family. And family dynamics can be very complicated. Uh, I think many of us wish that we had a trusted physician who really knew us. Ms. Woods Harris talked about a surgeon being called in from another hospital who had never met her husband before. And the doctor, a primary doctor who'd known the patient over a long time, really taking more of a, a social role in the hospital. Uh, but that recommendation from someone who really knows the patient, knows the family, uh, can be something that the patients find very, very helpful sometimes. Next slide, please. Uh, so to follow this, on this idea of decisions being uncertain and difficult, if we, as I think we are now beginning to say that it's appropriate, at least in some situations, to base decisions on a patient's values, goals of care, current best interests, as interpreted by the appropriate surrogate. So I say that's a huge legal and cultural shift since the Cruzan ruling. So in the course of 37 years, this country legally, ethically, religiously, I think in some ways has made a huge shift where we now are trusting the discretion and judgment of surrogates who are often very close family members. Well, next slide. Just a take home message. Advanced care planning doesn't and could not resolve all problems with end of life care. Uh, even if advanced care planning goes as well as could possibly be done, decisions will be difficult, unanticipated decisions will have to be made. But, and I'd be interested to hear what the speakers throughout the rest of the next two sessions say, perhaps advanced care planning can facilitate those discussions that have to take place at the time when critical decisions must be made on behalf of a patient. Thanks very much. Thanks so much. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Sidori. And uh, just before you get started, Rebecca, I'll just remind our folks listening in that you can, if you have a question for any of our four speakers, please put it into the Q&A uh, on your screen and we'll take some questions when we finish uh, with this last presentation. Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, I really wanna thank our patient advocates, Mo and Y, again, for sharing your very powerful stories. And I think they will shape our time here together and our eventual recommendations, so thank you. And thanks also to you, Bernie, Dr. Lowe, um, for always providing the important historical and ethical context. Um, I'm gonna be taking things a step further and talking today about the complexities of advanced care planning. What are we even talking about to try to help set the stage for the talks in the other sessions? Next slide, please. The objectives are to talk about what is advanced care planning and it's complex. Why should we do advanced care planning? And then what is known and yet unknown about advanced care planning and needs further research? Next slide, please. Um, so if we first talk about the definition of advanced care planning, the old definition, I think as Dr. Lowe um, discussed, was really focused on treatment decisions only, such as making decisions about CPR or mechanical ventilation. However, again, as Bernie sort of pointed out, there are issues related to focusing only on treatment decisions due to studies showing the flaws in prediction into you know, the future contexts, in all contexts in the future the ability of humans to adapt to new circumstances and the fact that people change their minds and issues related to extrapolating treatment decisions about CPR to other decisions. And I think probably the most important reason to reconsider this definition is research showing that what matters most to patients or people is not the treatment, but the outcome of that treatment and how someone's life will be after that treatment. So we had convened a large international Delphi panel to come up with a first draft definition of advanced care planning. This new definition was published only in 2017 and states that advanced care planning is a process 
that supports adults at any age or stage of health and understanding and sharing their personal values, life goals and preferences regarding future medical care. We knew even as we were writing up this paper that this definition was really a starting point and we would need to come back to this definition as the field matured. And I think that we're learning that advanced care planning is actually much more complex than this. Next slide, please. There are complexities related to readiness and life course. So this organizational framework from Respecting Choices talks about first steps, next steps, and advanced steps. And this may be thought of as the trajectory of someone's life course, but can also be thought of as someone's readiness to engage in the process, even if they have terminal illness, as we had heard in Mo's powerful story about her father. Next slide. Dr. Hyland, who you'll hear from in the next session, kindly shared the slide with me from his 2015 publication. In this figure, he and his colleagues have done a nice job showing how advanced care planning, which focuses on values, wishes, and preferences, is different from goals of care conversations in the moment or consent for treatment on the right-hand side, and how these conversations may differ based on settings, such as the home or the community, or when patients have serious illness in institutional settings. If you click forward just once, we should see a little red box. Well, the red box should cover the green and the, um, the red box is there. But when I reflect on the conversations that I have both as a geriatrics primary care physician and as an inpatient palliative care physician, the majority of what I help patients and their families with is advanced care planning or the stuff on the left-hand side of the slide. It can also be hard to tease out in real time sometimes at the bedside when someone's life trajectory creates, I would say, some overlapping Venn diagrams from talking about the future to somebody's current care. Next slide. Advanced care planning is also the result of a complex interplay of many stakeholders, which are shown here as separate pillars, such as patients, surrogates, the community where social norms are established, clinicians, health systems, including the electronic retrieval of advanced care planning information, and law and policy that support advanced care planning. In addition, although advanced care planning is complex and involves many stakeholders, no one professional group or service line owns advanced care planning. And given this complexity, it may not be reasonable, as Bernie was pointing out, to expect an advanced care planning intervention targeted to one or a few of these pillars to be able to positively affect all outcomes and solve all ills of our broken healthcare system. Next slide. There are also complexities concerning real injustice and health disparities that have played out so brutally during this COVID pandemic and were described so eloquently by Mo and Y, our patient advocates. Millions of Americans do not have access to clinicians or health systems or policies that would support that access or even basic medical care, much less access to trained clinicians who could walk people step-by-step step through the advanced care planning process. And given a large amount of justified mistrust, some communities will only do advanced care planning outside of the clinical setting with their families and friends. Next slide. So why should we even do advanced care planning? So this cartoon says, once you've been caught in the headlights, life seems somehow inexorably changed. And what has struck us the most in our recent scoping review of the advanced care planning literature and in our many focus groups and one-on-one -on -one interviews is that patients, surrogates, and clinicians say that they want advanced care planning. And I would say most striking to us is that this is especially true if they have had experiences making serious medical decisions for themselves or others. And this to me really is a guiding principle for why the work that we're doing here together is so important. Next slide. So why should we prepare patients and surrogates? Well, clinicians cannot make recommendations or guide patients and surrogates in decision-making without knowing patients' values and needs. And unfortunately for patients and surrogates, this is highly individual and can only be provided by them. So without some form of preparation, patients and surrogates will not be able to communicate their values effectively. And this is especially true when people are under stress and when they have no prior relationship with the clinicians they may find themselves interacting with in a crisis situation. 
Next slide, please. Because of this, back in 2010, Terry Freed and I wrote a paper in the Annals of Internal Medicine calling for the redefining of the planning in advanced care planning and to move away from only focusing on life-sustaining treatments, but to also focus on preparing patients and surrogates for communication and in-the-moment decision-making. We've designed our person-centered prepare for your care program to help people and surrogate decision makers with this preparation, as does other evidence-based tools, such as PlanWell, which you'll hear about in the next session, and advanced care planning decisions, as well as community-based tools, such as the Conversation Project. Next slide, please. So what is known about advanced care planning? Well, we know that it's wanted, Patients report wanting to talk to clinicians about advanced care planning and expect providers to initiate advanced care planning conversations. Patients also view advanced care planning as a way to prepare surrogates and decrease their burden. And clinicians view advanced care planning as an important part of their job to help prepare patients and families for decision-making. Next slide, please. We also know that there are mixed results from research. In some studies, advanced care planning has been associated with increased advanced directive completion, patient satisfaction with care, and improved quality of life, goal concordant care, surrogate clinician communication, and decreased stress for the surrogate decision maker. However, we also know that there are mixed results, including from a 2018 review of 80 systematic reviews that included observational, qualitative, and feasibility and pilot, pilot trials. This well-written tour de force showed that many advanced care planning studies, as well as the systematic reviews themselves, were deemed of low quality, making it hard to make definitive recommendations. If you click forward just once, we should see a blue box. So the questions remain concerning what are the right outcomes for advanced care planning? Is the outcome of an advanced directive enough? Is quality of life realistic for a patient with terminal cancer who lacks access to medical care? And is goal concordant care reasonable given the very well-known measurement challenges of this outcome? In a separate published Delphi panel focused on defining outcomes for successful advanced care planning, although goal concordant care was considered to be the holy grail, the panelists also discussed that this outcome is very hard to measure and cautioned that the focus on this outcome could set up our field for failure. Next slide, please. Given the mixed prior findings with many low quality studies and systematic reviews, we completed a scoping review of 69 high quality advanced care planning randomized trials from the past decade. None of these trials have been included in any prior reviews. In brief, we found that the primary outcomes for all advanced care planning intervention types from written materials to videos to websites were predominantly positive. Mixed results remained, however, for health status outcomes, such as quality of life, and quality of care outcomes, for example, goal concordant care, were predominantly negative. However, outcomes were consistently positive for increased patient and surrogate satisfaction with communication and medical care, as well as decreased surrogate and clinician distress, outcomes we know are important to patients. Next slide, please. Finally, what is yet unknown and what are the areas for which I believe we need more research? First, advanced care planning is complex and can be many different things for different stakeholders and contexts. When we say advanced care planning, what do we mean? So for the following sessions, I think it would be very helpful to understand from what vantage point or definition we're making our recommendations. And do we need new definitions of advanced care planning by context, life course, timing, and stakeholder, stakeholders? And I think we also very much need patient and caregiver input on these definitions. In addition, since we know that advanced care planning is but one piece of the puzzle in a broken healthcare system, what are the outcomes that are reasonable to expect? Is an advanced directive enough? And is quality of life and goal concordant care realistic? Also, advanced care planning is not owned by any one specialty program or service line. This is both a challenge as no one group may be committed to moving it forward, but also an opportunity to normalize this process across disciplines and the community. 
And finally, should advanced care planning programs be taking a broader, more holistic approach where we use rigorous implementation science research principles in considering multiple stakeholders, context, culture, and workflows? Thank you so much for your time and I look forward to your comments and our discussion. Terrific, thank you all so much. If, if I can have um, Bernie and Y and Mo come back on with your cameras, um, we do have some questions for you. Thanks, thanks very much to all four of you for um, you know, such thoughtful presentations. Um, I wanted to start with a question for Mo and Y. And the question is specifically around patient advocacy. You, you both come from uh, that perspective. So if you would address how can patient advocacy help people understand and embrace the importance of talking about what matters with people who matter? And uh, why do you wanna go first? I will. I think we have to have a repeat, repeat, repeat session with uh, so many people in so many areas. I One of the things that I deal with is uh, the African-American in the faith community. And I know it has to be repeated so many times. And that's what we've got to do. We've got to make them realize that in making the plans and preparing that those are steps that they may be able to take small steps do one thing and not try to do, because when you look at the four corners of those forms, they, they carry a lot of uh, material that sometimes people just, they just aren't, they are not ready for it yet. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. And Mo, how, how about you? How could patient advocacy help with, with this? Can you hear and see me okay? Uh-huh, yes. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm chasing the internet around the house today, I'm sorry. <laughs> so I think something that is very powerful is um, personal stories, because so many times these are the eventualities that nobody likes to talk about until you have to talk about them. So I think the advocacy role is really important if you have a personal story that you're willing and able to share Sometimes it can, it can be the first step or it can spark the dialogue that people need to start having for their, for their own lives and maybe just make an impact in that way. I think that's the most important thing that I can do anyway as an advocate with my experience. Okay, that's helpful, thank you. I'm, I'm wondering, um, we had another question and it, it relates to what you both <clears throat> were both just talking about. Did you or your family members at the time um, understand the terminology advanced care planning? And Mo, let's, let's start with you. I, what, what was your frame of reference for that? I don't know that my family had a good grasp on what that meant. My dad was pretty young when he died, he was 62. And like I said, I'm much older than my siblings. My, my mother, um, was younger than my father and it just after after a series of conversations I think they did but I don't think they had a clear understanding of who was supposed to implement this plan mm -hmm. so to speak and I had a I mean I, I knew what needed to be done but again it's very difficult to have that dialogue with someone who is not ready to have that dialogue mm -hmm. so I went about kind of tucking bits of information away because I knew very early on that I was going to be the surrogate, the, the, the power of attorney for healthcare and, and I was. And so I just tried to pay attention as best as I could and, and listen to you know things that my dad would mention or a smell he liked or a certain blanket that seemed to, he you know seemed to be most comfortable in or those little things were really what my care planning consisted of. Okay, great. And why and you had shared with us that, you know, as a case manager and in some of your other work, you you are engaging with people in uh, advanced care planning processes. Did your husband understand the context for advanced care planning? 
My husband did not understand the that context, but he did understand the importance of us making decisions before it was too late. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things that I said, we had to do it in pieces in order to do that. And I can remember patients, me walking into the room with patients saying, do you have a living will? And I always remember this lady that said, oh, are you here to help my son take my money? So people do not, um, one word can just throw them off. Yeah, well, thank, thank you for that. We have a, a wide range of questions here. I'm gonna to try to get to a few more while we still have a few minutes. Um, this one is directed to Dr. Lowe. Um, any comments from you, Bernie, on the recent um, New Hampshire, is it New Hampshire Supreme Court ruling, which appears to prioritize best interests over substituted judgment? Um, are you aware of that one? And did you want to make a comment on, or just generally the best interest um, versus substituted judgment sort of you know, dichotomy? One, one of the things that's hard is that we tend to view things, as someone said, as either or black or white, either you're following, make, you're doing what the patient himself would have wanted a substitute judgment, or you're looking at best interests. In fact, it's usually a mix of the two. And in some situations, it really doesn't make sense to talk about substituted judgments. The patient really hasn't addressed the issues, uh, really has not even given an indication of core values you could extrapolate from. Um, you're sort of pursuing a fictional reason. On the other hand, I think there's certainly some situations where uh, doing what the patient said really makes a lot of sense. And those are patients who really understand what's about to happen. They're so close to things that they can anticipate what it is the next crisis is going to be. They've seen it. They might have experienced it, something like it before. And they mm -hmm. say, not again. So this happened, for example, in the AIDS epidemic early in, in 1980s, when gay men knew what they were facing. They'd seen friends die of it. They didn't want their biological families to make decisions. They were very specific. Another example, uh, Pope John Paul II had Parkinson's disease went to the ICU once with pneumonia. When he developed it a second time, he said, not again, I'm not going to the ICU. So someone said it's not black and white. Uh, we have to take into account all the complicated factors. Yeah, and, and you know, reflected in your comments too, it's, it's only the, the person and the family who can provide that type of information about the history and um, right. the values and preferences. Rebecca, there's a question for you here. Um, how does POLST fit in with adv advanced care planning as it documents um, goal concordant care and, and builds on the advanced directive conversation? Is that a part of your research? Um, so POLST isn't part of my research and I believe that there are a couple of people in the next section, session who'll be talking about POLST. Um, so I might leave that to them. Okay, very good. Certainly. Um, I, there are, let's see, there's another question then for you um, about goal concordant care um, at the individual level. It's elusive uh, because it can be undermined by an unprepared health system, as, as you said an unprepared clinician, an unprepared patient, or an unprepared family. So given all of that, um, do you have opinions about better intermediate goals that we could measure to indicate success? Yeah, I think, um, you know, as you point out, goal concurrent care is what we all wish and want for. But I think even just from a measurement standpoint, because things can change at the bedside at the last minute, it is very hard to sort of measure that. I think, again, as we see from the scoping review um, and, um, you know, we're hearing from patients and surrogates that some of the most important outcomes really are about surrogate burden. And to be honest, some of these studies are actually showing decreased clinician moral distress. 
So even clinicians may be having less distress that in some ways I feel like those are good proxies to tell us whether or not things went as well as they could have mm -hmm. or not. And some of that could have been due to good advanced care planning. Some of it could have been you know, due to wonderful clinicians at the bedside or a combination of both. But you know, I think some of those surrogate outcomes might be helpful. The other thing I will say is I know that there, we might be hearing from people um, in these next sessions about these type of outcomes. You know, we think about gold concordant care, about what happens after somebody dies. But I know that there are people looking at, well, are people getting the care that they want even, you know, when they're, they're getting other types of care. So I think that there are other ways that we can ask those questions and not just after death. Okay. Great. There's a question in here about um, dementia and so cognitive impairment. How, how, how has that changed the conversation around advanced care planning over the, the decades? I guess either, um, Bernie, do you want to start on that one? Well, one difficult thing about Alzheimer's, it's such a terrible disease, but the patient no longer is the pe person, the individual that people remember. Um, I had an aunt who was a brilliant research chemist who when she developed Alzheimer's, just lost so much of herself. Uh, and is she, to what extent are things that she said 10 years ago still relevant when she couldn't remember anything, but when I showed her pictures mm -hmm. of my children, she smiled and asked about them. Two minutes later, she asked again, do you have children? I showed her the pictures. Is that something that was still valuable to her? It's something she would have thought when she was at her peak was not worth living. Well, it's hard, it's really hard. Rebecca, you're the geriatrician. <laughs> yeah, you I mean, I think the thing that's interesting, you know, just like for other medical decisions, just because somebody has cognitive impairment doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have capacity to make decisions about some of these things. And I think, you know, we found, um, you know, even people with mild to moderate cognitive impairment can engage in our prepare for your care um, program and have these conversations. Um, the other thing too, I think, is when we focus on values and how people want to live, I think, um, it's been very interesting to me that even people with moderate to severe cognitive impairment have been able to have conversations with me about their values that are very, very consistent. And so I think it's not a black and white area, but just to say that even people with cognitive impairment can engage in these conversations. Great, thank you. And just, just one last question and then we'll need to transition. Rebecca, your research found that one of the driving factors for patients to complete an advanced care plan is to prevent burden on surrogate decision makers. And the recent high quality randomized trials you reviewed showed that it appears that ACP may be helping to reduce that burden. How has this changed the way you think about the PREPARE program and, and your research? Yeah, I am, um, you know, uh, PREPARE was really uh, always meant to be done kind of in a step-by-step -step process and with um, somebody's surrogate decision maker. Um, but I would say that um, really thinking about that surrogate preparation has really come more to the forefront for us. Um, actually, we have funding from the Greenwall Foundation thank you to Bernie and his colleagues, um, to help create um, surrogate preparation modules on PREPARE. Um, and I would say when we're going forward in our research, we are attempting to include those surrogate outcomes um, in all of our studies. Wonderful. Well, thank you. This has been a great conversation. I want to again thank Maureen Stewart and Wyvonia Woods-Harris for sharing your stories with us today. Very powerful and um, a really wonderful foundation for us to start this conversation. And to Dr. Bernard Lowe and Dr. Rebecca Sudori, thanks for joining us today and getting us started and framing uh, what we're going to be talking about uh, the rest of today and next week as well. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure.
Okay, at this time, we will move on to the next session, uh, which is titled Interpreting the Evidence-Based for Advanced Care Planning. And I'd like to introduce at this time, Dr. Susan Hickman, who will be moderating this segment. Dr. Hickman is the director of the Indiana University Center for Aging Research at the Reagan Streif Institute and professor at the Indiana University Schools of Nursing and Medicine. Um, welcome, Susan, and um, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Joanne. Um, I'm really uh, honored to be here today and grateful for the opportunity to moderate this session on interpreting the evidence for advanced care planning. Um, we have four panelists in today's session, and I'm going to start by introducing each of them in the order in which they'll speak. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Sean Morrison. Um, he's the Allen and Howard C. Katz Professor and Chair at the Brookdale Department of Geriatrics and Palliative Medicine at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai as well as the director of the National Palliative Care Research Center. Dr. Carol Montgomery is the executive medical director for Respecting Choices, which is a CTAC uh, innovation, the division of CTAC innovations. Next slide. Dr. Darren Highland is a professor of uh, internal medicine and critical care at Queens University School of Medicine. Um, and then finally, Dr. Pat Bamba is the Vice President and Medical Director for Geriatrics at Excellus Blue Cross Blue Shield, as well as the Director of the uh, uh, New York MULS program. Um, so I'm going to now turn the floor over to Dr. Morrison, who is our first panelist. Thank you, Susan, very much. And it really is a pleasure to see everybody. And again, want to really thank uh, the presenters from the last session. My task today was to talk to you about advanced care planning, specifically, what is the evidence and why does this matter? And I'm going to try not to repeat um, materials that you've heard in the past session, um, but there will be some overlap and that's intentional. Um, next slide, please. So just to put in perspective again, what we're talking about in terms of advanced care planning, which is really this quest for perhaps as Rebecca said, mythical, but I like to think that we will get there, the quest for goal concordant care. Next slide, please. Um, just so you know it, I have no financial relationships to disclose, next slide. And I do want to begin with the definition that Rebecca raised or presented earlier, again, so that we are all on the same page because so many people have different ideas and thoughts when they talk about advanced care planning. So for the purposes of my 10, 15 minutes of remarks, advanced care planning is a process that supports adults at any age or stage of health and understanding and sharing their personal values, life goals and preferences. And this is what's very important here regarding future medical care. Um, the goal is to make sure that people receive care that's consistent with their values, goals, and preferences during serious and chronic illness. And for many people, this is going to include choosing and preparing another trusted or trusted persons to make decisions for them in the event that they lose decisional capacity. And I wanna be very clear that this is different from having real-time discussions about real-time decisions, about in-the-moment discussions around goals, either with patients or proxies. Um, I think that is, all of us would agree that that is critically important, that we do this every single day, but that's not advanced care planning. There's no advance in that care planning. Next slide, please. And, Advanced care planning has a long and winding complicated history. Um, as Dr. Lowe said, um, it began back in the 1960s when patients were seen to be receiving unwanted treatments at the end of life, which led to the first living will in 1967. Um, as we learned through the 60s and into the 70s, not all treatment decisions can be predictive, which led to the idea of, well, if you can't specifically say what treatments you would want, 
perhaps you could designate somebody that you trust to make those decisions for you. That became the healthcare proxy or durable power of attorney, um, which was um, first signed into law in 1983 in California. And then we suddenly had the challenge that as was noted, patients or at least the worried well say they want these conversations, but physicians actually don't really engage in these discussions. And in fact, my very first research paper was titled Physicians Reluctance to Discuss Advanced Directives, um, which got published back in the early, published back in the early 90s. Um, that led to a proliferation of advanced care planning programs that were not dependent upon a physician office visit or a physician patient interaction. Um, we then discovered that even if preferences were documented, proxies named, they were available, um, those preferences weren't acted upon. And the result of that was the medical orders for life-sustaining treatment, um, first in Oregon in 1995, which translated preferences into actual physician orders that could be acted upon. We soon discovered that physicians still don't engage in advanced clear planning discussions and they don't engage in discussions nor complete most forms, which put pressure on Medicare to reimburse for these discussions. And we now saw financial reimbursement for advanced care planning discussions come in to practice in 2016. Um, and as we are now learning and certainly learned during the COVID pandemic, um, patients may not even be aware that they have a most form completed or indeed what it contains. Next slide, which brings us up to 2020. Um, Dr. Siduri talked a little bit about the evidence base of advanced care planning. And I just, again, want to summarize the amount of research that has been conducted in this area. Um, Rebecca noted that there were 80 published systematic reviews of advanced care planning that included over 1,600 studies. Yes, many of them were low quality. However, if you look at that body of evidence or that body of research, it's 1.5 times the number of studies that were done in delirium during that same time period. It's eight times the number of studies that have been performed in breathlessness. It's 15 times the number of studies that have been done looking at effective treatment of pain in children with cancer. Since that sort of very large group or distillation of studies was done, um, as noted, Dr. Sudori's group did an additional scoping review of 69 studies. And there have been three very well-designed randomized controlled trials, or I'm, let me rephrase that, sorry, there have been seven um, additional RCTs, one of which included over 16,000 patients, uh, or I'm sorry, over 15,000 patients in a large number of nursing homes. We have spent to date over $30 million in federal funding around advanced care planning research. That's just federal funding. That doesn't include monies that have gone to advanced care planning research from foundations and private sector philanthropy. And we've seen the prevalence of advanced directives, which we know the problems with advanced directives. But I would also argue that advanced directives are a reasonable surrogate for a completed advanced care planning discussion, be it a treatment directive or designation of a healthcare proxy. We've seen the prevalence of advanced directives increase from 26% in 1993 to 37% in 2016. And in 2020, 30 years after the Patient Self-Determination Act, less than half of the country still has an advanced directive. Next slide, please. So what have we studied? Well, we've studied a lot. We've studied adults of all ages, healthy adults, hospitalized adults, adults in critical care, adults living in the community, adults living in nursing homes, and adults with multiple different diseases. 
We've looked at attitudes, beliefs, and prevalence. And yes, um, consistently, what we hear from the public is that this is something that they would want and they would want their physician to discuss with them. And we've talked about the prevalence data. And we've looked at a number of different interventions, um, patient education and decision support, on um, physician, nurse, social education and reminders, nurse, so, social worker and physician led group or individual counseling, and then trained ACP facilitator led groups and individual counseling with a trained ACP facilitator. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And if we look at the preponderance of evidence, and as has been pointed out, we can find a lot of positive things. We can find that people's knowledge of advanced directives and advanced care planning improves. We can find that we can, in studies, increase completion of an advanced directive. We can increase documentation. Um, and indeed, we can even increase the rate of advanced care planning discussions um, with physicians if we measure that immediately after the intervention. Um, the long-term effects, we don't know very much about. Next slide, please. Yet, there is minimal to no consistent evidence from high quality studies that advanced care planning can do the following. Um, and again, this is not every, we can look and find some positive results on individual stories and every one of us can think about a patient which we saw one of these results. But if we look at the preponderance of evidence, what do we see? Well, we see that advanced care planning can't influence medical care at the end of life for persons lacking decisional capacity. It doesn't enhance the quality of death and dying. And we can talk about the fact that perhaps we can't really measure quality of life, yet we manage to do it in a number of other studies, in a number of studies of people with serious illness. And we do seem to see interventions that work. Um, we can increase the likelihood that end of life care is consistent with patient preferences. Um, we, really can't improve patient and surrogate satisfaction when we look at the preponderance of evidence and take all of it together rather than one or two individual studies. And the evidence simply isn't there that we can improve long-term surrogate quality of life or bereavement outcomes. Next slide, please. So why is it that despite five times more research than we see in pain for children, we haven't been able to conclusively find evidence that advanced care planning works to achieve its main outcomes. And I think some of this actually comes back to the premise and the actual process of advanced care planning, which is that Patients are able to articulate their values and goals and identify what treatments would align with those goals in hypothetical future scenarios. Again, advance. That once that process happens, that those wishes are documented or shared with a trusted surrogate so that when decisions need to be made and we can't actually talk with the patient, somebody is there to help us make those decisions. As was, be, as was raised a little bit in the chat, we also believe that surrogates will invoke substituted judgment to make the treatment decisions when needed. That is, they will make a decision which they know or they think their loved one would make if by some miracle could, they could sit up in the bed and make that decision for themselves. Clinicians need to honor those preferences and decisions. And our health system and the society at large that we work in will be able to support that goal concordant care. So that if somebody calls 911 in the middle of the night and says, my husband is in terrible pain, but doesn't want to go to the hospital, that somebody will come or be able to manage that pain rather than having to call 911 for assistance. And if we do all this, patients will receive goal-conforming care. Next slide, please. 
what's the problem? Well, there are a number. The first is that treatment choices near the end of life are not simple. They're not logical, they're not linear, they're not autonomous, and they're not predictable. They are incredibly complex. They are uncertain. They are often socially determined. They are clearly emotionally laden and they change over time. And they change almost daily or sometimes hourly, depending on what the clinical situation is. Second, substituted judgment presumes that surrogates can do really three things. They can extrapolate specific treatment decisions from distant general advanced care planning discussions. They can piece together what their loved one would have wanted and they can disentangle their own preferences, their emotions, and their feelings of guilt from the decision at hand. Is what I'm doing what my father would want versus what a good daughter would do, for example. And treatment decisions are not, do not occur in a vacuum. They're driven by financial incentives in the marketplace. We know that supply and demand influences the care that people receive in the setting of serious illness. They're influenced by the, our societal capacity to support patient needs, and they're strongly influenced by regional cultures and practice patterns. What we do in New York is very different sometimes than what happens in San Francisco or what happens in Portland, Oregon. Next slide, please. And continuing to invest in advanced care planning is not benign, and it does have consequences. First of all, Darren Highland has talked about the fact that poor communication skills that often characterize advanced care planning practice lead to goal discordant and suboptimal care. Um, Scott Halpern, who's talking the second session, has found that just varying the language used in advanced care planning changes treatment decisions. Treatment decisions or surrogate decisions are strongly influenced by the how choices are framed. And the lack of quality control around most discussions can lead to withholding of beneficial treatments. We saw during COVID too many patients who came in with most forms on their chart who had never known that they had completed such a document and disagreed with what was on them. And when discussions were had, opted for treatments that saved their life rather than from withholding them. And we also saw that the simple presence of a MOLS form during COVID discouraged many of our providers from having complex discussions because they simply didn't have time and it was easier just to look at the form. And our efforts devoted to advanced care planning, our research dollars, our clinical dollars, our workforce, which is limited, our resources, which are limited, come at the expense of addressing other important needs of people with serious illness. Next slide, please. So what's the, why this paradox? Why are we having this dis, four days or two days of discussion? Why is there such faith, strong faith, in the premise of advanced care planning, despite 30 years of evidence to the contrary? And I could argue, if we had this evidence base in any other area of medicine, we wouldn't be continuing. First of all, it's because of our respect for persons and belief that it really, really matters. Second, some of it is our uniquely Western belief that we can control what happens to us. There's commitment bias. That is, we don't, we are so, so committed to making this work that we can't see a way forward or a different way forward. There's confirmation bias. That is, we look for positive results in the studies that we see and ignore the negative. There are now financial incentives. People are reimbursed for having advanced care planning discussions. There's an industry in some respects that's growing up around it. And as many people say to me, what would you do differently? Is there an alternative approach? And what does it mean if we say, this just isn't working and we narrow our focus simply to appointment of a proxy? No. There's the grief over what we've been doing after years of effort. I spent the first 10 years of my career working in advanced care planning and trying to improve it. Um, and there is also coming to terms with the limits of autonomy as determinative of our life's course. 
you know, rugged individualism is a core US value. And it's very hard for us perhaps to say that it isn't the core, it isn't the way that we should be making decisions in these very complicated situations. Last slide. Sean, you're, thank you. You're over time, so please wrap up. I am going to, Susan. Um, so I would argue that the preponderance of evidence suggests that the long and winding road of Lilith's care planning should end. That as Dr. Sudori pointed out, perhaps we should be focusing on how do you better prepare people to have conversations? Perhaps we should thinking about how do we better guide surrogates through in the moment decision-making and how do we better have real-time communication about real-time decisions rather than focusing our effort on something that for the most part, just hasn't shown great benefit. Thank you all. Sorry about going over time, Susan. Thank you, Sean. All right, I will now turn um, the floor over to Dr. Carol Montgomery. Thank you, Susan. <clears throat> and I wanna thank the planners of the round table for the opportunity to participate today. Um, the perspective I'm bringing to the forum is not that of a researcher but rather the perspective um, of clinical and healthcare leaders as consumers of the research on advanced care planning and how it's used to inform and guide our work in the real life settings with organizations and communities who are driven to improve the standard of care for all. The maturation of the definition of ACP has been discussed earlier, but I think it's important to note that this also has occurred in the context of um, other changes in healthcare, including the growth and development of palliative care as a recognized specialty, along with a movement toward palliative care, or excuse me, um, person-centered care as a, as a pillar of quality, which was a movement in, in influenced by consumerism and calls for transparency from the public. And that in turn has driven a shift in the perspective on the role that patients can and should play in decision-making and has required clinicians to adopt a belief that knowing a patient's goals and values can and should change their role in the decision-making process. And all of this evolution has taken place within the greater context of a healthcare system that is increasingly complex and fragmented. So all of this shifting in the surrounding milieu of healthcare, it's no wonder that it's a significant challenge to interpret the mixed history of evidence base around advanced care planning. Next slide, please. So in that context, I want to elevate the scoping review that Dr. Sidori mentioned briefly previously, um, because I think it really is important body of work that provides an update to the evidence base around advanced care planning. And it really effectively addresses the deficiencies of the prior systematic reviews because it included only randomized control trials, the gold standard of research study design, and it included only publications from the last decade. And from the nearly 1500 studies, they found 69 randomized control trials that met their inclusion criteria of which 70% were published in or after 2017, so very recent literature, of which 94% were rated as high quality using the JEDAD scoring method. And importantly, as has been mentioned, none of these were included in prior systematic reviews, likely due to the very recent timeframe. So this scoping review included studies that were homogeneous in study design and of high quality, but on the next slide, you'll see that it also continued to accurately reflect the variety of research taking place, including various definitions of ACP, although notably 40% of the studies included are using the more common definition of ACP as a process. The studies also tested different interventions across different populations at various times in the trajectory of life or illness and in different settings and in total measured 170 different outcomes across the 69 studies. The scoping review then used a framework for organizing the outcomes that has been described previously in 2018 by Adelphi panel consensus. And in doing so, we're able to tease out which outcomes were most often impacted across all of the studies that looked for them. I'm not gonna review all of those outcomes that were identified in the scoping review. 
but instead really want to look at the outcomes that were most often positively impacted across the studies that looked at them, because I think a meaningful story emerges. But before reviewing on the outcomes, this next slide um, can help us pause and reflect again on the ultimate stakeholders in this work, patients and their surrogates and family members. They've already weighed in, in which advanced care planning outcomes matter most to them. And based on their lived experiences, patients tell us they want to be involved in their care and decisions. They wanna talk with their medical team about advanced care planning to help prepare them for decision-making. And they see ACP as a way for preparing their families and surrogate decision-makers and decrease their loved one's decision-making burden and ultimately ensure that their own wishes are honored. <clears throat> And in fact, if you advance the slide, we can see that the majority of these very recent high quality RCT studies significantly impacted these patient desired outcomes. Specifically of the studies evaluating process outcomes, measuring things like patient readiness, confidence, self-efficacy, indicating they're on the path to engage, 72% were positive of the studies evaluating action outcomes, measuring things such as completing an ACP conversation, having a discussion with family or creating ACP documentation, 86% were positive. 88% of the studies looking for congruence or agreement between a patient's goals, values, and beliefs and their surrogate or clinician's understanding of them were positive. 100% of the studies looking at satisfaction with communication of care, whether from the perspective of the patient, the surrogate, or clinicians, were positive. 67% of the studies evaluating surrogate satisfaction with decision-making had positive results. 75% looking at surrogate satisfaction with medical care were positive, and all of the studies 100% of them that looked at the health impact on surrogates as measured by depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress, and complex grief showed a positive impact. So what about goal concordant care? I actually believe that if we're doing all of this work correctly, goal concordant care should be hard to measure. Patients want help to prepare for making decisions in the future, not to make decisions prematurely for a future hypothetical event. So they the sur and their surrogates will be ready to participate as equal partners in that decision making when that future unpredictable complex situation arises. Because that's the moment when treatment preferences are put into context and goal concordant care either does or does not occur. It isn't something where a static goal can be recorded in advance against which future care is then graded. And that's the challenge with all patient reported outcomes, right? They require the voice of the patient to be meaningful, or perhaps in this work, the voice of the surrogate or family member, where surrogates understanding what matters most to their loved ones, the congruence, surrogate satisfaction with communication, decision-making, medical care, and where surrogates can experience less suffering under the burden of decision-making, all are appropriate proxy measures for goal concordant care. So again, when looking at only very recent high quality RCTs and using a framework in which to organize the various outcomes, this scoping review really helped to illuminate the outcomes that matter most to patients were impacted significantly by the majority of studies that looked at them. On the next slide, um, I also wanna comment that it is encouraging to see that more recent studies are including populations of increased diversity, but that that doesn't necessarily mean that the outcomes achieved are shared equally across all populations. And when looking at outcomes of ACP, as in all of healthcare, we really are obligated to explore, understand, and work to eliminate the disparities that exist across populations. And rather than describing a need to increase or build trust among the underrepresented populations, I would argue that healthcare really needs to focus on becoming more trustworthy and preparing individuals and their trusted loved ones to engage in healthcare decision making could be a first step in that journey. Very recent work shows the effectiveness of advanced care planning in accomplishing just this across races, ethnicities, and socioeconomic status. The three studies here are just uh, top of mind examples I listed 
um, and include examples from Maureen Lyons' work using the Respecting Choices intervention in HID, HIV um, positive adult populations in an urban setting that demonstrated advanced care planning significantly improves congruence between uh, or of treatment preferences between patient and surrogate dyads. And impressively, that understanding persisted over time, even as patients' treatment preferences changes, what we call the enduring power of a conversation. And then the second two listed here are two other examples that are trials um, looking at prepare for your care that demonstrate within populations where there's a high prevalence of limited health literacy and non-English speaking patients, um, there can be achieved a very high level of engagement in advanced care planning. And the second one listed here showed a 41% increase in active participation during clinic visits. So there are many other examples of important work being done to evaluate and address disparities in advanced care planning, um, which I think is very important work to, to continue. Um, but if preparing individuals to engage as equal partners in healthcare is a first step toward becoming trustworthy, completing that journey really requires embracing the shift in power at the point of decision making and believing that clinically we can't know the right care to deliver without knowing what matters most to the person that we're caring for and that we apply that to all care, including prior to illness, early in chronic illness, and all the complex decision making that unfolds up to the end of life. On the next slide, um, as I mentioned previously, the perspective that I bring to this work um, is really from those who are looking to research to help guide practice. But I also want to acknowledge the importance of evidence that exists beyond formal research grade evidence. In fact, it's estimated that of the current clinical recommendations in medical practice, only 18% are supported by high grade research based evidence. The remainder are supported by other levels of evidence to guide and optimize practice. And so just as research informs practice, practice should inform research. And far more than a collection of anecdotes, practice-based evidence emerges from shared experiences, clinical examples, expertise developed during clinical practice. And out of this comes the recognized need to advance this work using implementation science to examine what works for whom and under what circumstances and how effective interventions can be adapted and scaled in ways that are accessible and equitable and confirm the strategies that work. So pragmatic trials should have a significant role in future advanced care planning research as they're better able to measure, evaluate the challenges of an evolving complex process across various stakeholders and in real life situations. So this should be our path forward to achieve what we know patients and surrogates want and to continue on the journey to becoming trustworthy partners in their care. Great, thank you so much, Carol. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I'm gonna now uh, turn the floor over to Dr. Darren Highland. Um, and as a reminder, uh, each presenter has 10 minutes and then we'll move into a panelist discussion. Thank you, Susan. Thanks for the opportunity to participate in this discussion. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I'm a bit of an outsider, so I hope I don't say anything that doesn't fit or doesn't help move this discussion forward. I say I'm an outsider, not only because I'm Canadian, but I'm also a critical care doctor. And I feel like I have been a witness to a lot of human suffering because people come into an intensive care environment ill-prepared for decision-making and not always getting the care that's right for them. Next slide, please. If the goal of advanced care planning is to try and increase person-centered care or increase goal concordant care or increase the process of communication and decision-making around the use or non-use of life-sustaining treatments, I think we've got a long ways to go. These are not randomized control trials as summarized in systematic reviews as to the value of advanced care planning, but rather audits of that communication and decision-making process where decisions are being made about the application or withdrawal of life-sustaining treatments. And I think they're suggesting we've got a lot of room for improvement. Next slide, please. And so, yeah, we can look to the RCTs 
and I, I, I'm not going to summarize this body of evidence that has been uh, nicely uh, stated by other speakers, nicely summarized by Rebecca and her, and her group. I just want to make one key point that there's tremendous amount of heterogeneity here, where not only is the intervention and how it was conceptualized different across these studies, but the population, their case mix, where they're at in their life journey, the setting of where the, the care and the discussions occurred are quite different. And then of course the outcomes are different and variable. And so our, our valuation of this corpus of data might be but dependent upon you know which piece or pieces of that heterogeneous uh, body of data that we examine carefully. Next slide. My key point would be that there's too much heterogeneity in this body of data, uh, data for us to make meaningful conclusions. I don't think it's fair to say that ACP works or that ACP doesn't work. I think we need to move to a uh, a higher degree of granularity or homogeneity that includes standardization about what works and what doesn't work. I'm also quite concerned about um, the current definition and conceptual framework for ACP. I see it quite problematic because planning for death under conditions of certainty is not the same as planning for serious illness under conditions of uncertainty. And I'll speak to more, more to that on the next slide. I also am quite concerned about what I observe where decontextualized planning conversations get equated into medical decisions. I think the current approach where we rely heavily on conversation, open-ended questions that elicit values and preferences is also prob problematic and may explain why there's still quite a bit of medical error in this space. And I'd like to challenge the assumption uh, politely and respectfully that people are not in informed consumers where it's as simple as just asking them what they want. So let's, next slide, let's elaborate some of these ideas. And here's a confession from a critical care doctor. You know, most of the plans are all framed around end of life. If I am dying, this is what I want or what I don't want. The problem is when I see you and you're short of breath and I'm trying to decide about the application or withdrawal or withholding of life-sustaining treatments. I don't know if you are dying. I don't know if this is your death episode. So what validity do plans have when made under a certain context, I, when I am dying or if I am dying, this is what I want or do not want, when applied to a different context where there isn't certainty about that this is your final episode. And that's been documented nicely with work done on POLST, where people with advanced illness fill out a POLST and ask for comfort measures. And yet when they present with their serious illness, um, ICU clinicians are sending those types of patients to the ICU over a third of the time. And that's disconcordant care. And there's a call out to us as ICU physicians to say, hey, smarten up, be more respectful to those patient with, with wishes. But in fact, is it a problem with us or is it a problem with the tool that focuses around end of life care when we can't make that diagnosis of dying in that instant? Next slide, please. So one of my other challenges with this space is that advanced care planning being too heterogeneous, too broad, encompasses all three of these core activities. The decontextualized conversation where people are encouraged to think about death and dying and uh, name someone to be their substitute decision maker. The part where they're preparing for uh, decision making where they're informing themselves about different treatment op options and clarifying their values. And the part where it actually gets reduced to a medical order for the use of, next, of, of life sustaining treatments. Uh, there should be an animation if you want to push the next slide. What I see too often, though, is that people in a decontextualized environment, even sitting at their kitchen table filling out a form, that that decision made in advance becomes the actual decision in the moment when we're trying to make decisions about the use or non-use of life-sustaining treatments. And it misses that in-between in step of preparing the patient 
And it violates healthcare law in the sense that I have to go through an informed consent process where I'm explaining the risks and benefits and possible outcomes and making a, a, an optimal treatment decision and a shared decision-making model. And ACP in real life often circumvents that process and is a, the piece of paper is used as the treatment made rather than a more fulsome conversation. Next slide, please. So what I'm advocating for is that we shift a little bit from trying to encourage people to make uh, decisions in advance, uh, but more rather to indeed, as Rebecca has been arguing for a decade, that we need to focus our activities on better preparing people for making decisions in the moment. Next slide, please. So if we're all in agreement in that process of better preparing people to speak to their values and preferences, I don't have time to go into this body of work, but we've looked very carefully at how well people are able to express their authentic values and their informed treatment preferences. And we conclude that they're not, that those value statements that they make um, are sometimes in conflict with other things that come out of their mouth as another expression of a value and bear no relationship to what might be the, the treatment preferences. So we as physicians are left trying to make that interpretation of what that value statement mean and how does that connect to a medical order for the use or non-use of life-sustaining treatments. That process is irreproducible, non-transparent, and also I think is an explanation for why so much medical error exists. Next slide. What I'm trying to say is that people need a lot more decision support if we're going to ground their care on values and preferences. It has to be way more sophisticated than just saying, hey, what's important to you? Or, hey, what do you want us to do? And assuming that what comes out of their mouth actually is an authentic value and an informed treatment preferences. Next slide, please. That's why my colleagues and I have shifted this away from planning for death, but rather thinking, helping people think about serious illness and providing those uh, uh, more sophisticated tools using values constraining tools and also providing a decision aid that highlights the difference between ICU care and medical care and comfort care and um, using an innovative grid transparently in a reproducible way connects the pe person's stated values with a possible uh, informed treatment preference. And so that's uh, wrapped up in a program we call Plan Well Guide. And I'm citing some evidence on the slide, which I won't have time to review with you today, that it increases the chances that patients are gonna get the medical care that's right for them. And at the same time, reduces the time that the physicians have to spend helping uh, that person obtain their um, uh, the medical care that's right for them. My last slide, please. So what I would like to propose the way forward involves is actually a shift away from the current language because of its 30 year baggage and framed around making treatment decisions in advance for end of life care. When really what's, what we're all wrapped up about is trying to provide optimal medical care, person-centered care for uh, people with serious illness, where there's an uncertainty if this is their final episode. And most of the activity should be funneling off here to the left, where we're preparing people uh, to be able to speak their authentic values and their informed treatment preferences. And so that involves more sophisticated tools and decision aids and the legally naming or the functionally naming of someone to make decisions for them. Whereas over on the right-hand side of the screen, yes, okay, there will be a more limited role for filling out forms in advance that pre-specifies treatments, but that has to be contextualized. That has to be disease and situational specific. That is the educated person who knows their health issues, who's in a con conversation and a decision-making encounter with a physician, filling out a form in advance to guide their final journey to the finish line. So I would wrap this up as called advanced serious illness preparation and planning and suggest that we move away from what has historically been a, a bit problematic for us as advanced care planning. Thanks for listening to my ideas. Thank you so much, Darren. Um, and now um, for our final panelist, Dr. Pat Bamba. Thank you, Susan. Um, I want to sort of start with 
um, thanking everyone who's spoken before me, but in, in particular, um, Mo and Y for framing our conversation today, because at the end of the day, what matters most is what I think Rebecca and other speakers have talked about is what matters most is what, what the patient wants, but also reducing burden for both the medical decision maker, be it a healthcare agent or surrogate, as well as for ensuring that the family um, does not have burdens um, after the death of a loved one. I have no conflicts of interest. Um, I've titled my, my presentation, Advanced Care Planning is a Right. As Bernie said, Dr. Lowe said, uh, with Patient Self-Determination Act, we have a right to make medical decisions. They're made through our lifetime. It does not end at the end of life. We have 50 states, 50 different forms, 50 different sets of public health laws that guide uh, end of life decisions, but the same ethics as Bernie pointed out. And I think it's rather than throwing advanced care planning away, I think it is important for us to continue our work of culture change to integrate advanced care planning and healthcare planning in the same way that legal planning, financial planning um, has already been well integrated into everyday life. Next slide, please. There are lots of variations that impact the evidence base, where decisions are made, um, what type of healthcare delivery um, is provided, and the fragmentation of our healthcare system has already been addressed. Um, as, a, as a geriatrician over the last 40 years, I have seen moving from paternalism, where physicians have made decisions, to autonomy and expecting patients to make decisions. Uh, what you want to really the shared decision-making model. And I really um, would want to give credit to an 85-year-old woman who helped me to understand how important shared decision-making is um, back in 1983 um, as part of my pro professional journey. Um, it is important also to keep in mind that decisions in the ICU just in the moment can be complicated by the fact that many individuals don't have capacity. Similarly, they may not have capacity when they arrive at the emergency room. Next slide, please. So taking a look at all of the other speakers' presentations, I decided to um, make this a pragmatic presentation and taking a look at what's how New York State has evolved uh, advanced care planning, which really aligns with the Delphi uh, definition uh, that was presented today with um, one exception that I'll speak of in a, in a bit. Um, advanced care planning, I think as all the other speakers have spoken about, um, is a process, it's a communication process, but there really are two types of documents that end up as a result of this. And it's the population health approach that we've used in New York. Advanced directives specifically focusing on the healthcare proxy and choosing the right healthcare agent was part of a program that was developed because in 2001, we did not have a surrogacy law. So unless there was a healthcare agent designated, medical decisions could not be made on behalf of the individual who lacked capacity aside from resuscitation preferences. We didn't have that surrogacy law until 2010. Um, living wills have never been really focused on in our state because of many of the issues that the previous speakers have talked about. And in particular, I'd, I'd emphasize that reversible illness often coexists with an irreversible condition. A potentially reversible aspiration pneumonia coexists with terminal end-stage dementia. In our state, however, healthcare proxies are the only legal document. Living wills are recognized under case law. Medical orders are really for a smaller uh, group of individuals. Like in New York State, it's our MOLS program. The medical orders are uh, focused on resuscitation preference, respiratory su support, hospital hospitalization transfer, and other life-sustaining treatment. But it is really for those individuals um, that, are, that have advanced illness uh, and or advanced frailty. And if one looks at the uh, 
the rainbow, this really emphasizes it's, it's a continuous process. What someone values at 18 when they're young and healthy and who they choose at 18 is not the same as the individual they trust at 85 and their values and beliefs have clearly changed over that period of time. Similarly, if you look at right before the purple arrow, it wouldn't surprise the uh, physician if the person dies in the next year or so. Over that period of time, over that last year of life, values, beliefs, goals, and preferences change. Next slide, please. So one of the important programs that I think aligns with the Delphi program is the general program called Community Conversations on Compassionate Care, which really emphasizes teaching about uh, learning decision making, except that it should choose the right trusted person, which is a healthcare agent. Uh, the stories that I will talk about briefly on this slide, Bill and Debbie's story uh, is a story of preparing ahead of time and having that burden for the surrogate and the family be lifted because of the conversations that were had versus Joanne's story that basically uh, her uncle thought he had all the time in the world, didn't prepare, and the impact on her, 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 her uh, aunt, who suffered through three and a half months of her uncle on life support and struggled it, with it for years to come. On the left side, Trisha, Lee, and Lucia are all stories where it's not just about death and dying. It's about incapacity, the inability to make decisions, and recovery. And in all of those situations, knowing that there was an appointment of the right person to stand in the shoes and make decisions, as well as knowing what mattered most at that point in time, helped the individuals to move the story forward. I didn't include the data from this program, which we've been using since 2001, but over a period of five years, we were able to increase from 20% advanced directives focusing on healthcare proxies to 42% in some regions, as well as the conversations and the key factors that we saw in a, in a study of 2000 individuals that was a well-designed study reported were uh, physician recommendation as well as community education. Next slide. But getting to the point of uh, goal concurrence uh, care, we knew that creating these documents, having conversations would not get people what they want wanted. We saw the value of the PULSE program with early research back in the 90s, and New York created the New York MOLS program. In this slide, you'll see that that virtually every state or almost every state is really working on developing this type of program, but it's not for the entire population. It's for those who might die in the next year, those who live in a nursing home, recognize or, or receive long-term care services at home or in assisted living of any age, but typically of advanced age, have desires about what they wish to receive or not receive today not when they die, but today. And those are what medical orders reflect on. Typically those that have one or more advanced chronic illnesses, advanced frailty, or those that are continually having unplanned admissions to the hospital because of lack of social support. Recognizing that completion of the form is completely voluntary, but it's not a form, it's, it's the end of a process. And screening is important to assure the appropriateness um, for this population. Next slide, please. There are lots of studies about pulsed and gold concordant care. Our esteemed uh, moderator today, Dr. Susan Hickman, conducted a, a study in nursing homes looking at pulsed comfort care orders, and it was associated with fewer treatments in comparison to those who wanted full treatment and had no pulsed form. Concordance was at a level of 94%. Not so much in the hospital setting in a study that uh, I present here. And that's not surprising because POLST will really be the medical orders at the time when the person transitions to hospital care, but it's a set of medical orders and the patient's health status and prognosis may change and requires ongoing conversation. Next slide. 
I want to show you the complexity of New York State's process for completion of a MULS form. And it really goes with the first stage that we talked about, which is really preparing for the discussion. And it's only step seven when the form is completed. And it really makes sure that people are prepared for the discussion, understanding are there advanced directives? Is there a properly completed healthcare proxy? Who's the decision maker? And, and what are the requirements? In New York State alone, there are three public health laws, as well as a special process called surrogate Surrogate Court Procedures Act 1750B that governs decisions for those who have intellectual or developmental uh, disabilities but lack capacity. It's complex and well it should be to be able to go through this process to ensure that it really aligns with what patients would be making decisions, either substitute the judgment or best interest. What I would say uh, lessons learned from New York has been the importance of screening for the appropriate population, the importance of assessing capacity because people may still have the ability to make these decisions, making sure that people understand health status and their and uh, prognosis before goals and, and also developing a palliative care plan uh, to support the caregivers as well as, as ensure pain and symptom management is available 24 seven. Next slide, please. To make sure that we were able to have a secure process, we developed a uh, website, newyorkstateemulsregistry.com, which is an online completion system as well as registry. It's a secure website, it's person-centered, it's a free public health service. It has the online completion system that I outlined at all the legal requirements. And once it is signed by an authorized provider, it is part of the registry automatically. It can inter integrate and has been integrated with EPIC and other EMRs, as well as our HIEs, including HealthX, the largest uh, RIO in the country. I wanna just share before I conclude some of the data during COVID um, that we looked at as of the end of this uh, third quarter. We currently have approximately 50,000 live patients in EMOLS. Average age or mean age is 82, median age 85. In looking at preferences, 82% of the individuals wanted DNR, 72% DNI, others wanted trial. 21% didn't want to go to the hospital, others didn't want to go. What I would say is during COVID, 20% of these medical orders were reviewed and renewed as part of that process. Last slide. To be able to look at what happened during COVID, we moved very quickly, shifted to telemedicine, and the increased interest um, in EMOLST expanded widely. I can talk about that in the Q&A. And final, our next slide. To be able to accomplish and to avoid some of the pitfalls that we've seen and that have been discussed is really to work on culture change with community partners and make sure we're moving upstream with the appropriate populations uh, in our practices where there are trusted individuals. And we need to, as Dr. Montgomery said, increase the trustworthiness of the um, health system. And last slide are my key points and we'll just put them up and open it up. It, we, we know that we need to choose, or in New York, we would say we should choose a trusted person foster culture change, build patient-centered systems, and establish metrics that are different for the general population for advanced directives versus medical orders. And the bottom line is it is complex, but it is right. And we ought to be measuring what matters most to patients and families. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pat. Um, so we're now going to move into our um, discussion section. And initially, we had um, significantly more time um, scheduled both for uh, questions to the panelists um, in a more constrained uh, session and then an open session for questions from the audience. Because we um, have gone from, I think we had 35 minutes initially to now we have 15, um, we will uh, go ahead and do sort of a blend of that. So I've been monitoring the questions that have been coming in. Some of them uh, match questions that I've actually prepared as well. I'm gonna ask each of our panelists to come 
to, to turn their video on at least um, and be ready to respond um, to the questions. And my first question will actually be for, um, I think I'll direct it towards Carol. Um, uh, and I've seen this reflected in several of the comments as well in the question and answer box. So there have been a lot of dis, uh, dis varying dis definitions of advanced care planning, including um, we've heard many people argue that advanced care planning is most helpful and appropriate for patients with serious illness who are near the end of life. Um, however, um, there are there also is a model of care, as Rebecca Sidori alluded to earlier, and thinking about um, backing up and preparing people earlier in the course of illness and thinking about preparing people not just for the end of life, but for decisions during the course of their disease. Um, I'm curious if you think, uh, Carol, that early advanced care planning is appropriate and if so, under what circumstances? Thank you. Yes, I, I um, fully support the process definition of advanced care planning that has been reviewed today. Um, that does talk about supporting all adults at any stage to understand and share what matters. So, um, you know, talking about what some might call upstream advanced care planning, um, does help for preparing individuals for, because serious illness doesn't always happen predictable, at, predictably, and of course, even we as clinicians can, um, can predict. So I think there is a role for preparing individuals to enter into decision-making. Um, the conversation in early ACP absolutely needs to cover different content and probably has a different um, ending to it than one that is preparing truly for end of life when those proximal those decisions become more proximal. I believe it's problematic to wait to introduce advanced care planning as relevant for only those with serious illness. Um, the downside is that again puts us in healthcare in control of when to engage a patient more fully, and I think that's disrespectful. Um, to individuals and their families. And I think we know that there are so many services that are of benefit to people in ser with serious illness that are accessed way too far downstream. And I would worry that we would create or recreate that same problem with advanced care planning if we sort of pigeonhole it to be relevant only to those with serious illness. Thank you, Carol. Um, Darren, um, I have a question for you now. I'm, I'm really curious in terms of your involvement in the development of uh, kind of new models and ways of thinking about um, advanced care planning and your really high quality research. And I'm curious, um, you know, there's been significant progress in terms of developing consensus about outcomes and measurements, as well as the need for measurement development. What do you think needs to happen in the science to build upon this important conceptual and methodological work? I think one of the missing gaps is how much we help people develop their authentic value statements. If you think about how much the research enterprise invests in measurement of patient reported outcomes or quality of care metrics or quality of life metrics, think of all those studies around the psychometric properties of X, Y, and Z. And yet we ground important clinical decisions, life and death decisions on patient values. Where, where's the research and methodological development that helps us make sure that we're actually measuring something that's reproducible, something that's valid, something that's predictable or translatable into a clinical action? So for me, that's one of the biggest missing pieces. And I think the other part to that is decision aids, that there, there's a growing body of work um, that decision aids support people in serious illness, they make better decisions, et cetera. But from the implementation side, people are making serious illnesses all the time without being having access to something that we know is out there and working. So those are two, there's probably others, but those are the two that come to the top of my mind. Great, thank you so much. Um, Sean, I have a question for you next. A couple people have raised this. Um, so there are essentially, uh, you would summarize the Jimenez uh, systematic review of systematic reviews and the widely variable uh, research that was presented within that, which the authors concluded was of low, low or poor quality overall. Um, and then we also uh, heard a pretty detailed presentation from um, Carol about the recent systematic review published by Rebecca Sidori and colleagues um, looking at the um, 69 uh, RCT, 65 of which 
which were judged to be high quality. And I'm curious, and I think I'll also, I'll open this up to Carol as well as to you, um, Sean. I'm just curious about how you put those two together and how you make sense of that. Yeah, um, a, a couple of ways uh, I would think about this. First of all, um, I always sort of hesitate when people ignore a large body of research just because it happens to be old. Um, so I do think for something like this, it is really important to go back and look at the entire body of work because there were high quality studies in the past. Um, and so looking at what's done most recently in the absence of that, um, I think is in somewhat a disrespect to those prior researchers. That being said, and I think this is also the critical fact, when you look at the randomized controlled high quality studies, and you look at what they were designed to do, the main outcomes. Overwhelmingly, when you look at those results, the main outcomes were negative. What comes up and what people cite as the positive, and I think this also comes back in terms of what I talked about around confirmation bias, that is looking for, looking for results that fit with your, what you wanna see within the studies, you can find in the secondary outcomes, um, some results that you would think would be positive, hopeful, and move us in the right direction. The challenge though, is that those are in the secondary outcomes. They, the studies weren't designed to actually ask that question. And what we really should be looking at is the comprehensive body that looks at the main outcomes rather than sort of picking out positive outcomes when we find them. And if we look at that whole body of work, the main outcomes just don't support in a strong, conclusive way, what we'd like to see. Um, and that's why I have very reluctantly, you know, come back to, it's time to leave this. It's time to start thinking about how do we better guide people to make decisions when the decisions need to be made, rather than thinking about hypotheticals long in advance. So just in follow-up, so are you suggesting we shouldn't talk with patients ahead of time about their goals and values, even with a model such as Darren presents? Not at all, Susan. And yeah, don't, don't, don't put that in my mouth. What I'm saying is that on every clinical encounter, people need to know, their physician needs to know who they are because that's going, to, that's going to guide how we care for each other. In the setting of serious illness, we absolutely need to know what people's values and goals are because we're making decisions about that illness in real time. You know, it may be tomorrow, it may be the next day, it may be in a month. What we shouldn't be doing is focusing our time, effort, and money on having conversations with people who A, may not experience serious illness for years and years and years. B, may never think of it, may not have that encounter or really have thoughts about that years and years and years ahead. That I don't think is very useful, but that's what advanced care planning is. That's different from having a real-time goals of care discussion about something that matters right now. So I'm, I'm curious, because when I hear you say that, I hear what uh, the definition Rebecca shared earlier. So I feel like we're getting into a little bit of semantics, and I'm going to ask the other panelists uh, their thoughts on that. So I can start. Um, I guess I, you know, I don't think that just discarding prior randomized prior studies because they're old is really what I was intending to convey, um, but I think it's important to understand the massive change that's gone on in the milieu of healthcare in the 30 years that this research has been conducted. The analogy I might use um, is another process in healthcare that was once perceived as simple um, that has now an evolved understanding as a complex process it is. And that is what we used to refer to as discharge planning, a singular event, a point in time, clear owner, um, individual accountability. And now we understand that as one piece of a complex process that we refer, refer to as transitions of care um, in a much more holistic way. And so I think to look at some of the older studies around advanced care planning is when advanced care planning was thought of as that singular transactional point in time event, like a discharge planning. 
And today you would never read research about how to optimize a discharge plan. It's about transitions of care, recognizing the multiple stakeholders. So I guess that's where I'm coming from when I say that the milieu in which the research is conducted has evolved. And so can we rely on studies that were done in that older paradigm? Carol, Darren, did you wanna add something? Just briefly, uh, at the risk of putting words in Sean's mouth, um, I think what he and I and perhaps others are saying is that everybody agrees that efforts and energy and further research should go into better preparing people for in the moment clinical decisions. I think what we're also trying to say is that having lay people, even, even seriously ill people, make treatment decisions in advance that are expected to be followed blithely in the future is, is high risk of medical error. And we ought to rethink that paradigm. Unless we can lock down that decision as a truly informed, authentic decision, um, then maybe it has some validity. But otherwise, I think we steer away from that and move to more, how do we better prepare people for a shared decision-making model when they have their next exacerbation of their symptoms? That could be life-threatening. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you. Pat? <laughs> And I would just reemphasize the, the process um, and really looking at from a population health perspective, those with advanced illness and advanced frailty, really having the opportunity before they lose capacity to be able to weigh in on these decisions. And to be able to do that really goes back to making sure over time there are honest conversations about what matters most, not about interventions, but what matters most to them. And to share that not only with their healthcare agent or surrogate, but their family. And so that living is a family event, dying is a family event. And the second piece is as you get closer to where it wouldn't surprise the physician that someone might die in the next year, then having more of us conversations are important. And I would say, I, I went through it very quickly, but a lesson learned is oftentimes people are starting to make these decisions by talking about what matters most without understanding what their health status and prognosis is. And so if they think they have 10 years of life and, and they really are hospice eligible, their decision-making will be different. So it's important for us to prepare for those conversations as well as have the individual or the decision-making prepare to really have well-informed shared decision-making and really getting that pre preparation and how to make medical, medical decisions needs to be done upstream. It's no different than making decisions about surgery, radiation therapy, a lab test, x-rays, and really being able to do it. And I would say the, the four questions I used in my practice are probably ones that Bernie would comment on, but will treatment make a difference? What are the benefits? What are the burdens? How will it help? How will it hurt? Is there hope of getting better? And sometimes there's a missing corollary. What's life gonna be like afterwards? Because at the end of the day, the fourth important question is, what's important to you? What do you value? And if you tell me, Darren, that the best I can hope for when I value life as a grandmother, or Bafshi in Polish, the best I can hope for is to be on the ventilator the rest of my life with a peg tube and never know my grandkids. Or you tell me I'm going to get better and enjoy life as a grandmother. I'm going to make different decisions. So that I think is it's incumbent on us to make sure we're answering those questions in thoughtful ways that people can help make decisions. Thanks, Pat. Um, I have been told we can go for another five minutes up until 2.29. Thank you to Bob for uh, giving us four of his five uh, last closing minutes. Um, so I am actually going to um, ask Darren, I'm going to ask you another um, question. Um, you had observed that um, terminally ill patients can make medical decisions in advance for future life-ending complications in consultation with their clinicians. Do you see a role for advanced directives and POLST for people with life-limiting serious illness who are at risk of life-threatening clinical events? Sure, but the challenge is that oftentimes those decisions are made without the clinician that's involved in the actual decision, in the moment decision making. Imagine a scenario of a patient I saw with advanced cancer with uh, a prescribed living well that said, if, you know, if I'm dying, no heroics, but they presented heart failure. 
And did they know with 24 hours of positive pressure ventilation and a squirt of Lasix, I could get them out and back to how they were still with a, six, a several month trajectory of life. And so I can't cope with that uncertainty of what they knew, what they didn't know, how informed, how comprehensive that planning conversation was. I can't cope with that. So I'm left with a surrogate who's ill-prepared. And so the default in critical care right now is to intubate and sort it out later. And, and so our, there's a failure in our planning process if in critical care, that's our default. We have no trust or reliability in the planning process. Now, if you and your state have figured that out and you've locked it down tight and you can ensure the validity of those kinds of treatment decisions, I'm in favor of them. But, but because we can't cope with any uncertainty, I prefer to shift away from making these treatment decisions in advance and just codify the values and the preferences and recognize that they have to go through an informed consent process with a substitute or, or with the patient if they're able when that hiccup you know, comes. Great, thanks, Darren. Pat, I had a question for you, but you're also raising your hand, uh, so I can tell you want to add. I just would add that when people come into the hospital, they come in with a set of medical orders, literally. They have the, whether it's from the nursing home or the list of the medications that they're taking from their physician, it's no different than having a pulse form. This is the information in the time of the emergency, and that's what's followed but it means that the physician has the opportunity to then evaluate their health status and prognosis. It's medical orders are not one and done. And so that the in-time discussion with the surrogate, because likely they, don't, they lack capacity is absolutely appropriate. Just one brief supplementary comment though. And I agree with what you said, Pat, but the real-time audits of real-time practice show that the paper is often used as an excuse for a conversation. And so if there was a mistake in, the, in what was codified under one context and there's no conversation with the substitute, then medical errors are being committed. Uh, and I would say that's, I didn't get a chance to talk about EMOS in great detail, but that's what we've tried to do. We've, we've basically created a system that has no medical errors and it includes the conversation as well as the medical orders. And there's documentation over the care transitions so if it started in the hospital and went to the nursing home for post-acute care, then went home, all appropriate patients, it is all there. And so that's, a, I think that's where we need to go in the future. I can't speak to, because I can't study the paper, paper world. It's too complex. But I can tell you with 50,000 live patients in our system, we have the ability to provide more research in the future. Thank you. And I'll, I'll note there's several comments in the Q&A about EMRs. I don't think this exactly hits all of them, but I think uh, sort of touches upon that area. I think the the final, oh my gosh, we have one minute left, so I'm, I, I'm not even sure uh, it's worth trying to ask this question, but I am curious. Um, you know, there was some references earlier to how our experiences with COVID-19 have um, really changed our thinking about um, about advanced care planning and elevated the importance that was a comment made uh, in the initial session. Um, and I'm curious, uh, and I, I, I think I have 30 seconds now, Pat, if you wanna comment on that at all, it'd be helpful. Yeah, I think that our experience, and I would speak from the email system and reiterate what I said, and it follows up with Darren's concern. We saw in our system, 20% of those orders were reviewed and renewed because of COVID. We also saw patients who basically wanted to have additional conversations and change, potentially change their email orders. We were able to provide data to systems that had, had used it, like NYU, for five years to be able to do outbound calls, to be able to connect people with in-time conversations where it was in light of COVID. So I think the, the future with what we'll be able to have with electronic medical records and combined systems that are person-centered is really where we need to go um, because it's very difficult to, for sustainable education, which is the part we didn't talk about, which we've embedded into our system so that people know how to have conversations as well as videos that they can educate in time. So 
I think that's more than 30 seconds. So I'll be yeah, thank you. And I, I apologize. We are now officially out of time, even with our extension. Thank you to all of the panelists for the great discussion and for your very thought provoking presentations. Um, I'm going to turn the floor back over to Bob Arnold. So I want to thank everyone in particular. I want to thank Susan, thank everyone except for herself. I want to thank Susan. Uh, in the uh, question and answer, we put where you could get copies of uh, the uh, material. So I encourage you, thank you, uh, to go to the website. We hope that you will all be able to come back uh, next week where we'll talk about different ways that we might move forward as well as the last part of this. We'll uh, talk a little bit. We'll have some people who watch both of these and we'll sort of, they'll be our audience surrogates. We'll be asking them questions and asking them uh, to give us some comments about what their views are. I also wanna point out that a large number of you have questions. We'll be sending those questions to next week's speakers as well so that they know what you wanna know that we didn't get talked about. Thank you all very much. Again, thanks the National Academy uh, for the, their staff's amazing work. Thank you.